So tonight the topic is about Israel as a Jewish and democratic state. And history, as many of you know, is the telling of the story of the important moments in time. What happened, when it happened, and to whom it happened. But it is not merely a reporting of facts. Infused in the job of the historian is to not only understand the events that occurred, but to situate them in their particular context, domestic events, the international arena, and the human decisions that contribute to the occurrence of those events, and then to analyze those events in order to understand the multiple narratives and meanings ascribed to those moments. As we know, history is not a parv or neutral subject. It is often debated and contested. Rarely is there a neutral interpretation to historical moments in time, particularly when it comes to Israel. Today, what I'm going to try to do is put our topic, Israel as a Jewish and Democratic State, in a historical perspective. It is not only the historical framing, but I it's not the only one, but I believe it will be beneficial to us as we consider what does it mean for Israel to be a Jewish and Democratic State in the 21st century? Can a nation state have a healthy tension between its particularistic community and beliefs while also valuing universalist ideals, human hopes, and democratic processes? Those are the questions for today. Small questions for 40 minutes. So as Ed said, we're celebrating a lot of historical moments. And you left an important one out, 1897, the first Zionist Congress, in which we heard already a cacophony amongst different Zionist visions for the future of a state of Israel. From the cultural spiritual Zionists, many of whom calling for a binational state, to the political Zionists of Theodore Herzl and others calling for a nation state that could have been Germany in the Mediterranean, um, to religious Zionism from Rav Cook, and socialist Zionism, as we know from David Ben-Gurion, and everything in between. That was the first form of democracy within the Zionist movement, meaning women had a vote, you had a discussion, you had disagreement, remember they're all Jews, <laughs> and you had ideas being put forth very often in contradiction to one another, yet it was still a discussion about the possibilities for the future of a Jewish state. As, we, as Ed said in November, we celebrated the centennial anniversary of the Balfour Declaration, written November 2nd, 1917, by Lord James Balfour, at the time the Foreign Secretary of the British Empire. The letter was sent to Lord Rothschild, who was the honorary president of the Zionist Federation in Britain. This letter served as the first major political achievement in Zionism within the international arena. The official declaration committed Britain to a favorable stance toward Jewish aspirations for a sovereignty in Palestine. The Balfour Declaration reflected the Zionist choice to focus on Britain as its primary political patron and it secured the leadership of the Zionist movement to Chaim Weizmann, who led this approach from 1914 on and was the driving force behind the declaration. The declaration stated that Britain favored the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people, and it being clearly understood that nothing should be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. These few words elevated the Zionist movement from one of possibility to reality. And putting this moment in a historical context, it is only a few short years after President Woodrow Wilson's 14 points talks, in which he clearly articulates that all people have the right to self-determination, including Jews. Although the Zionist movement had emerged in the latter part of the 19th century, the Balfour Declaration was of great significance, signaling to the world that the Jewish people were both a religious group and, and this is important, not only a group as a confessional or religious identity, but also who had agency and desired to be a nation like all other nations. It was the coupling of religion and peoplehood in the form of a modern nation movement, nation state movement. The British understood 
that the Jewish national home for the Jewish people must be anchored in this tension between particularism and universalism, hence ensuring that there would be no discrimination toward the non-Jewish communities in Palestine. As the British mandate over Palestine expired, the Jewish People's Council gathered in the Tel Aviv Museum and approved the proclamation declaring the establishment of the State of Israel. The declaration outlines the historical Jewish connection to the land of Eretz Yisrael, as it is referred to in the declaration, where a spiritual, religious, and political identity was shaped. Similarly, the document refers to cultural values of both a particular nation and universal significance born from this particular territory and the writings of the sacred texts of Judaism. And it is in these texts that we see already the aspects of both particularism and universalism and constant dialogue with one another. Whether it's particularism around the Israelites and what they are supposed to do and not do, as well as the writings of the prophets and how they should be behaving in a larger universal setting. As the Declaration says, and I'm quoting, the State of Israel will be open for Jewish immigration and for the ingathering of the exiles. It will foster the development of the country for the benefit of all its inhabitants. It will be based on freedom, justice, and peace as envisaged by the prophets of Israel. It will ensure complete equality of social and political rights to all its inhabitants, irrespective of religion, race, or sex. It will guarantee freedom of religion, conscience, language, education, and culture. It will safeguard the holy places of all religions, and it will be faithful to the principles of the Charter of the United Nations. Now, as we know from all founding documents, these ideals are aspirational. They are not necessarily what reality brings, but I think noting them as aspirational is an important part of the historical moment. Again, Israel as a newly formed nation state had a dual responsibility. To ensure that the Jewish people throughout the world had a homeland and a state that would provide for them, ensure their security, while simultaneously reminding us that this new state had a responsibility toward the other, those who were not Jewish in this particular territory. And so begins the challenge of Israeli society finding the balance between the Jewish character, the particularism of the nation state, and its democratic characteristics, the universalism. The stresses of religious, national, and security burdens are felt and have been felt throughout Israeli society. Israel, as many of you know, did not enact a constitution at the time of its establishment which therefore has only led to a lack of consensus over the identity of the state. So now we're going to look at a few examples to illustrate the complexity of these issues. And, have, and we'll first begin with looking at the issue related to religion. An easy place to start. So first of all, how was Zionism understood? What was its purpose? Well, as we said, there were different purposes. If you were David Ben-Gurion and you were a secular socialist Zionist, you didn't imagine that religion was going to play any fundamental role because religion was going to go by the wayside. Not exactly what happened, but this is what he imagined. If you were Rav Cook, you had a different idea of what the role of religion would be within this future state of Israel. The role of religion was to still usher in a period of a messianic age. However, even those secular uh, pioneers, the Chilonim, um, the Chalutzim, who were secular, could engage with um, Jewish ritual significance by working the land. The working of the land in and of itself was a ritual act, a religious act. This is not exactly how it unfolds, meaning the competing sources of authority were coming not only from Zionist discussions, but also from those who were a-Zionists, the Haredim. And the Haredim imagined that the source of authority should be none other than halakha, Jewish law. Now, the majority of Haredim, as we said, are a-Zionists. Some of them are anti-Zionist, a small portion. But the Haredim are interested in continuity. Why? 
because their population has been decimated because of what has happened during the period of the Holocaust. They're not interested in renewal at all in the same way that the cultural spiritual Zionists are, or even the religious Zionists. For them, the state of Israel is viewed as a means designed to enable the reconstruction of the Torah. For the Haredim, the state lacks value except to the extent that it can rebuild the Jewish past. Now the secular Chiloni, those who are, who are building the state of Israel, very much in line with uh, Ben-Gurion's labor socialist Zionist position, for them it is very clear that civil law will define citizenship, and civil law and democratic structures and processes, processes will be the foundation for this future state. When David Ben-Gurion comes to America to meet with Jacob Blaustein in 1950, David, Jacob Blaustein is the head of the American Jewish Committee, and really sort of the appointed American Jew who's making decisions on behalf of the American Jewish leadership. David Ben-Gurion says something to Blausin in these exchange of letters that they have that he doesn't say to any other country in diaspora, any other um, Jewish community in diaspora that he's speaking with. First of all, J David Ben-Gurion says, I'm not going to ask any of you American Jews to make Aliyah. Why? Because it's 1950 here, and it's been explained to me very clearly that American Jews need to be able to acculturate and assimilate in order to help the American writ large society. Secondly, we need your support here. We need your support in terms of the support that you are going to provide us, both in terms of financial means, as well as one day, hopefully, political leverage. Second thing is that I, David Ben-Gurion, will not be speaking as a representative of all Jews, but only the democratically elected prime minister of the state of Israel. This was an important conversation that Blaustein and Ben-Gurion have with one another because Blaustein wants to ensure in these exchange of letters that Israel is established as a democracy, that it does not go the way of communism. He also wants to ensure that the non-Jewish citizens of this state will be protected, that there will not be discrimination, that there will be equality. And he wants to ensure that, that Ben-Gurion understands as prime minister that he is not the elected representative of the Jewish people something Bibi Netanyahu forgot a few years ago when he made his statement. This is the kind of um, presentation that David Ben-Gurion had to engage with. It's called compromise. It's how a democracy is going to function. It's how you get buy-in from multiple parties and different types of institutions and individuals. So the secular desire to have civil legal structures put in place. There was a third way and that was by the religious Zionists, a position in the middle. And it saw itself as being very um, important to the Zionist discourse, particularly after 1967. And it translated its Zionist vision into both religious terms, but also able to work within a secular society, meaning part of the political um, parties that existed become part of the coalition. And it had a sense of desiring to endow all of the activity that takes place in this territory with greater significance than merely civil structures and um, nation states as understood in the 20th century. But as we can tell, these Jewish visions do not offer a shared life or a shared unified identity. And if there are partnerships between these sectors of society, they are typically only for practical or operational purposes. We know that the Haredim ultimately did not win in the, t in the desire that they had for where the source of authority should come from because they desired a theocratic state, meaning a state based upon Jewish law. However, the question of who is a Jew and who determines the answer to that question still remains contentious within Israel and particularly for those Jews living in diaspora who seek to make Aliyah and may find themselves in a position that questions their Jewishness and their Jewish identity. Israeli society in many, in many ways aggravated and has become aggravated over the question who is a Jew? Who can become Jewish? Whose authority is it to decide? Secular Jews created a Jewish state, yet religious Jews feel, in many ways, that they have a monopoly. And because of the way the coalition government has been arranged, they often have more voice than they represent. So the question of how did this come about? 
And again, historical context matters. The status quo agreement. Have many of you heard of the status quo agreement? The status quo agreement was an agreement between David Ben-Gurion and many of the religious leadership. And they were attempting to negotiate interests between secularism and religious issues, outlining how the state would respond to certain demands of the religious community. Now, this wasn't unique only to the area of Eretz Yisrael, of what becomes Israel. Throughout the Ottoman Empire, you had the Millet system. The Millet system, M-I-L-L-E-T, was the system in which there was autonomy for individual communities that were minority populations. So it allowed those individual minority communities to be able to have autonomy over certain personal status issues, education for their children, um, marriage, divorce, burial, these kinds of issues. Ben-Gurion, who studied law in Istanbul, thought the Millet system was a system that worked, and it was a system that had existed in the region. So he decided to keep that system, yet frame it within the Jewish concerns. So the status quo agreement highlighted four important aspects. One, that Shabbat would be kept, meaning you would have no public transportation on Shabbat, except, of course, in Haifa, which was a communist kind of city and had more coexistence with Arabs, and so therefore um, wasn't as important. You had kashrut, meaning the keeping of kosher, specifically in governmental institutions, like the army, the Knesset. You also had an, a, an agreement that rabbis would control personal status issues. These are the issues still of marriage, divorce, and burial. It means that in Israel today, in the 21st century, there is no such thing as civil marriage. It means in Israel, in the 21st century, a democracy, there is no such thing as a civil divorce. And education. Education is a little bit complicated. Education meant that there would be different streams of education. There would be a public school system stream. There would also be those who decide to stay in a religious institution, a cheder, a yeshiva. Um, then you also, of course, had a national religious movement. And then as time has gone on, you now see other educational frameworks as well. It means that what we have here in America or what public education was built on in America was not the same in Israel, and it means that this is also why the army is such an important socialization process. However, you still exclude two populations, Arabs and the Haredi, one by choice, one by someone else's choice. So as we see, it is extremely complex to chart out here what it means to be Jewish. The control of the rabbinate prohibiting civil marriage within Israeli society remains difficult for many of us as Americans to swallow if Israel is to be a democracy in the 21st century. And also, what does it say about a society when its citizens don't have the freedom to determine how and to whom they choose to marry? Another example of Jewishness of the state imposing itself is the conflict over the Kotel, for example, what many of us heard about over the summer. The Kotel, in many ways, is a national symbol of the Jewish people. Yet, some rabbinical leaders in Israel have decided that it is a religious symbol of the most extreme manifestations of Judaism. And therefore, they exert control over where women can pray, whether or not a Sefer Torah can be utilized by them, and how women dress in this sacred space. Now, it's not all so depressing. There are some changes occurring within Israeli society that are important to mention. First of all, there is secular there are secular sectors um, within Israeli society who are engaged in studying Jewishness, Judaism. This is studying of classical texts within pluralistic yeshivot, like Pardes or um, or others in other locations, um, Alma, other places. There's an entire Jewish renewal movement that's taking place within um, Israel, especially, again, the spirituality component and pluralism. You also have other streams of Judaism, like the Masorti and the Reform Movement, now gaining some foothold in certain places. And there is a desire to seek to integrate and continue the Jewish 
past rather than completely rebel against it. The Zionist narrative that wanted to dissociate itself from religion is not the dominant narrative um, today. The Haredi community is also undergoing some change. There's, un there's a process of democratization. In the last decade, a sector of the Haredi community has engaged in higher education in order to be integrated within Israeli society and the labor market. The Joint Distribution Committee, for example, is involved in setting up different economic business colleges for the purpose of being able to teach members of the Haredi community how to engage in modernity and to be able to also continue to study. Um, some Haredim are beginning to enlist in the army. Um, however, we see that protests, again, have taken over much of these issues, and it remains very unresolved. Now, the issue of religious Zionism continues to play out. Uh, the religious Zionist conversation, you don't see as much as a messianic ideal. does exist, of course, with some fringes for the hilltop settlers. Uh, but you do see a sense of... Um, Messian, uh, religious Zionists engage very much in political discussions and does, they do not see themselves on the outside of that conversation, but rather inside that conversation. All of these issues around religion and state, the Jewishness of the state, are contested. They are debated in Israel. There is not one acceptable only position. So as many positions exist in this room, tenfold they exist in Israel. That's an important piece to understand because these are conversations that are happening. In the exact same breath, I will tell you, this summer when the issues over the Kotel arose, there was a reality that many secular Israelis did not understand the issue around the Kotel. And so what it gets, it's beginning to show you is that there is a divergence between the two largest Jewish populations, the American Jewish population, which cares very deeply about this issue for a variety of reasons, and also because it's very much an Anglo movement, and also because the Israelis, who are the Israeli Jews, did not understand who most of whom do not choose to go to the Kotel nor want to spend time um, praying at the Kotel, do not understand why this matters so much. And the two populations are not often discussing this issue. So you do see some divergence taking place. Another example, just to show some of the divergence between the two populations, the American Jewish population, in terms of how we vote, tend to still vote left of center democratic, democ you know, for the Democrats, the Israeli Jewish population, even if they don't like Bibi Netanyahu, continue in a, in a majority to vote for the right of center political party. This is a big shift in the Jewish peoplehood conversation and one that is not often being discussed. We can come back to that in a minute. But what I'd like to now focus on are the tensions between particularism and universalism as they specifically relate to the Arab population. Because within that conversation of universalism and particularism, Jewish and democratic. In terms of the democratic piece, the Arab population is a major conversation that is taking place, meaning the minority population in Israel and how they are related to and by the state. From the period of 1948 to 1966, Arabs living in Israel, those who chose to stay in Israel, <coughs> received citizenship. They, however, were under a military government. They were under a military government up until the period of 1966. Now, 48 to 66, there were curfews. There was, for sure, some inequalities, especially around education. However, they were allowed to vote. There were Arab members of the Knesset. They were allowed to engage in organizing. They had freedom of speech, freedom of press. From this period of 48 to 1966, the Arabs who are citizens of the state are asking themselves an issue of nomenclature. How do we refer to ourselves and how do others refer to us? Are we the Arabs of Israel? Are we Israeli Arabs? Are we Israeli Palestinians? Are we Palestinian Arab citizens of Israel? If we're the Arabs of Israel, there's a denotion of ownership by Israel. So what does this mean for us and for our identity? These issues of nomenclature begin to play out during a process called Israelization. 
The Israelization process was a process that not only in terms of a top-down, but also a bottom-up movement of what does it mean to acculturate and become Israeli? What does it mean to become part of this society? And what does it mean for the Arab population, many of whom had a deep connection to a territory, who had a deep connection to the soil and the land, who had family members who were either expelled or who left after the experiences of the 48 war. So what does it mean to have a relationship to this nation state? This is a major question that exists within the population of the Arabs who are minority citizens. Now, that's about 20% of the population of Israel, about 1.3 million somewhere around there, in terms of Arabs who are citizens of Israel. What happens after 66, really after 67, changes the conversation. After 1967, when Israel, after the, after the 67 war, now has access to territories it did not have access to previously, the Golan Heights, the West Bank, East Jerusalem, Sinai, and Gaza, now the Arabs who are citizens of the state of Israel begin to have renewed contact renewed communication, familial ties can be again built, and deeper knowledge about Arab culture, Arab history, Islamic practices, um, began to infuse many of the Arabs who were citizens of the state of Israel in a way that they hadn't from that period of 48 to 66. And the events of the 1967 war amplified that question of who am I? There was a greater sense of schizophrenia for many of the Arab citizens of the state of Israel, because they were asking themselves, how do I, as an Arab who lives in Israel, view the Palestinian organizations, and how do I understand Palestinian identity? And who is the representative of the Arabs in Israel within the conversation of the Palestinian conversations that are taking place in the West Bank, where Fatah has its headquarters? In the period of the 1970s, the Arabs in Israel begin to organize themselves in a way that they hadn't previously. During that 1970s period, the Arabs in Israel began to move away from some of the Israeli political organizations from which they had associated, like the Labor Party, and said, we do not want to be co-opted anymore by Israeli Zionist entities, and we need to organize ourselves. So they began to form their own political parties. Some of this was by pushing some of the Jews out of the Communist Party, and having the Communist Party in some ways become a much more Palestinian nationalistic party, which was acceptable because Palestinian nationalism was understood in their framework as being um, an acceptable form of a national movement, whereas a Jewish national movement had an issue, they had an issue with. You also begin to see land day protests, which begins in the 1970s, 1973. This was really the first major top-down organizational efforts by the Arabs. They are part of this, they create a national manifesto, the Committee for the Defense of Arab Lands, and they were concerned about the Judaization of the region of the Galilee. Other regions as well, parts of the Negev, but primarily it's about the issue of the Galilee. And they're questioning to whom does this land actually belong? And the Land Day protests carried great significance because it commemorated as a symbol the struggle to defend Arab lands. Arabs began developing their own political programs in order to advance these, these particular platforms in the Knesset. And they want to be heard. They want to have their own political organs in order for their Arab identity to be expressed fully within the framework of a Jewish nation state. In the early 1990s, during the Oslo period, more Arabs, however, who were citizens of the state, were willing to join coalitions with Israeli parties and vote in elections because there was this sense of a possible partnership and a sense of peace. However, by the late 1990s, after the failure of Oslo, in which Arabs did not feel that this would, possibility would exist, this is when you begin to see a shift in that the Arab population begins to refer to themselves as the Palestinian citizens of the state of Israel, purposely taking the Palestinian nomenclature and removing the Israeli nomenclature. Um, and this begins a process of what is referred to as the Palestinianization, instead of the Israelization, of the Arabs who are living in the state. There is a growing sense of inequality. I don't want to diminish that whatsoever. 
inequality, especially in the areas of education, lack of opportunity socioeconomically, that is a real concern that exists amongst the Arabs. However, that being said, there also begins a, uh, an argument, especially in that period of the 1980s during the rise of post-Zionism, that the original sin in which Israel is created, which is beginning in the period of 1948, not 1967, and that the original sin is Israel's form of colonialism, right? It's seen as being, being an imperialistic entity. And there is a discussion by the Arabs to label themselves as the indigenous population, the aboriginal population, and they want to begin making claims as a national minority group. And this has implications in terms of how the world then understands this particular um, sector of Israeli society. So there are four demands that exist within the Arab Palestinian, those who desire to label themselves as Palestinian Arab citizens of the state of Israel. One is that they desire for Israel to be a non-Zionist and a non-Jewish state, to de-Zionize and to de-Judaize. And they are forming, for example, different political parties for just that purpose. So Balad, for example, run by Azmi Bashara when it was first formed, was that type of political party. The second is opposition to any kind of Jewish symbols um, and things like the law of return. So having opposition to the state flag, for example, um, having a menorah, for example, on a coin. So any kind of public space having those types of Jewish symbols are seen as um, marginalizing the Arab population. There's a desire to have a recognition of Palestinian nationalism, and that Palestinian nationalism grants rights to Arabs on a collective national basis as a collective national minority. These are the particular claims. We can go into greater detail about them if you are interested, but these are the claims that are made by many of the Palestinian Arabs who are citizens of the state of Israel. Now, as we know, the challenges to Israel as both a Jewish and democratic state are challenges in terms that go beyond just these two issues of religion and of the Arab population. There is a challenge in terms of the West Bank and what it will mean for Israel if it continues to hold on to the West Bank and thinking about demographics and the issue of those demographics, let alone security concerns. And the other piece, of course, is what does it mean when you do not live in a neighborhood that has any possibility for leadership among the Palestinians, let alone the larger region, um, it, that's in constant turmoil. And so the question of how does Israel uh, maintain both its universalist and particularist um, identities in this particular region raises some questions. Um, so what do we do with these pressures which are very real and in certain moments feel particularly daunting? It is the blending of the universalism and the particularism, the deft tightrope walk that requires seeing the other while retaining Jewish, Israeli Jewish unique identity. Um, as public intellectual Leon Wieseltier wrote, there is no choice between particularism and universalism. Nobody comes from nowhere and nobody goes nowhere. The universal allows us to build bridges and speak to strangers unlike ourselves. And when we understand the stranger, it is because of the reality of our own particular experiences. So it is with that that I'd like to open it up to a conversation and any questions that people may have.